but in the traditional sense, we'll, we'll call the primary or the, the major cut flowers carnations, chrysanthemums, and roses, and then we'll go into some others. The way I'm trying to structure the lectures about each crop is talk a little bit about the history of those crops, where they came from, uh, where they are in our culture, and uh, prior to just not just talk about um, what, how to grow that particular crop. Um, this make it a little more interesting. Dios Antos um, was one of the early names for the carnation, and it was first written up, written up by um, Theophrastus. It was called the flower of the gods. Uh, it was often used as the coronation flower. The the first cultivation records that are, uh, that we can see where it's actually cultivated on a regular basis was uh, by the Romans. Um, Romans cultivated them for for centuries, and during um, the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the monks maintained the germplasm. And actually, a lot of the germplasm of the world was maintained by monk, monks in their, in their gardens inside their monasteries. And this is one crop. And it was there uh, in, in those um, particular circumstances until about the 13th century. Now, where did carnations uh, originate? Um, there's a lot of different literature. Um, some say it originated in Spain. Um, it's uh, one of the Mediterranean species that we, we deal with. Uh, it was taken to Tunisia or Tunis as a medicinal tea. And in 1270, the, it was taken to France, uh, probably by the uh, soldiers in those days. In the early French writings, um, the, we, we see that it was, um, uh, King of Naples, when he retired to the Var district of France, um, indicates the first modern cultivation of carnations as a cup flower. So that's a little bit of a brief history of it, early days. And the Normans then carried it to England after 1066, and it was called the clove gilly flower. And King Edward III, uh, as people uh, grew it, and it was not coined as his current Latin name until Linnaeus came along, and he named the species, species Dianthus caryophyllus. And Car Dianthus caryophyllus, the caryophyllus um, in the species epitaph refers to the gar uh, re re refers to cloves because the aroma of a, gar of a carnation is somewhat like clove. And so that's the history of how it was, its nomenclature came about. So the early breeding of the carnations, um, 18th century, it was in Europe for greenhouse flowering as a pot plant. They had what they call the tree carnation. And the gardener in the literature named Dalmaze, who was a French gardener in Lyon, um, Lyon probably is the correct way to say that. Um, developed what we call now the first perpetual blooming carnation. In other words, blooms and blooms and blooms. It doesn't have to go through a vernalization cycle. And the hybrid that he developed was a hybrid of carnation de Mahon. It was blooming in Nor November, and it was known to be a Flemish type. The carnations didn't move to North America until about the mid-1800s. Um, Charles Mark uh, took seedlings from Leon and um, with um, a greenhouse firm, Diadose, uh, which is back basically a farm in Long Island, uh, by 1872 had developed uh, over 50 cultivars. And so the original development of the carnation industry in the United States developed on Long Island. And for those of you who have been on Long Island, uh, Long Island is more than uh, a suburb of um, New York it, or Manhattan, but it goes many, 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 many miles out, and you go towards the very, very tip of Long Island, and there's nothing. There's peach orchards, um, very uh, agricultural area, lots of vegetable production, and that was the center of agriculture to support Manhattan. And over the years, it's uh, become more and more affluent, but still, the very, very far end of Long Island is, is fairly rural. And it sticks out there in the middle of the Atlantic and is very exposed to um, 
the Gulf Stream, which includes hurricanes. Um, so the, the Long Island development from 1863 to 1900, the American uh, Carnation Society registered more than 650 cultivars. And actually a lot of the records of the, of the American Carnation Society are archived at Colorado State University in our library. In fact, um, the carnation industry was very strong in uh, Colorado for many years, and there are some reading assignments on the history of carnations. If you go to the um, Lori Library website and just Google or enter in their search engine um, carnation, you'll bring up everything from images of uh, letters written by Amy Eisenhower to the Colorado Carnation Growers Society, thanking them for the presentation of flowers of when she was on campus. Um, so, carnations, um, we have two different inflorescence types. We have what we call a standard and what's called a miniature. Um, these are not taxonomic classifications, these are uh, cultivars. Uh, the standards have genetically larger flowers and we typically disbud them on a regular basis to make the, the flower bud, the terminal flower bud, larger and, and stronger. The, what we call miniatures or spray types are the axillary uh, flowers are born on longer stems and we take the terminal uh, flower bud out to stimulate them to all, all the lateral buds to, to mature at the same time. Since it's originally a Mediterranean species, um, we typically uh, use that Mediterranean uh, climate to develop our production scenarios. So our modern cultivars, we have over 200 years of breeding work. And the present hybrid that we're using under most production, um, nobody really has a record of where it really came from. Uh, the original species, if you look at the original species of carnation, it had only five petals, five petals, and it was very spicy in its aroma, uh, like, like cloves. And we, most of the cultivars we use today are from a group of, of a, a genetic group called uh, Sim. White Sim is the primary one, and they're from the Sim group, uh, and some people think that the miniature, the more spray types, probably look more like the original species. And the William Sim cultivar, I mean, there's thousands upon thousands of cultivars uh, released from that point. There are several different colors. There's whites, pinks, purples, yellows, reds, apricots, combinations, different colors. And actually, the carnation itself is very easily dyed. And we dye the carnation by cutting it with a fresh stem cut and dipping it into a dye and the carnation itself will actually take the dye up and color its flowers, color its petals. In fact, it's so cool that you can actually split the stem in half, dip it in different colors, and you can have a multicolored stem and look like somebody at a punk rock concert. So, pretty bizarre. You did that in Botany Lab? Was it fun? Okay. So New England, early production um, on Long Island primarily. It shifted to Colorado. Actually, the carnation industry was very strong at the turn of the century um, in early 1900s. Uh, one of the first greenhouses to um, grow carnations was a company called Park, later merged with an, a garden center called Elitch's. Elitch Gardens was actually a florist before it became a um, theme park. Um, the early history of Elitch Gardens is they had a florist operation and then they merged with Park. Uh, park, park Elitch then had a large greenhouse operation, eventually gr growing into a garden center. And that garden center then they uh, started working with uh, one of the circuses. I believe it was Barnum and Bailey, but it could be Ringland. I don't remember off the top of my head. 
um, and they would take care of the baby circus animals while the rest of the while the rest of the circus traveled all over the country and grew into a petting zoo and the petting zoo grew into a carousel and a carousel grew into what you see today and in fact Elitch Garden still grows their own bedding plants. There is a greenhouse on the property. Um, if you're driving down I-25 and you go heading uh, southbound, if you look off to, oh, to the Elitch property at the very southern end, you'll see a greenhouse range and they still grow their own bedding plants. So Elitch Gardens is actually uh, originally a um, florist. Um, through the um, into the, into the 1950s, um, grew into Colorado. Um, uh, most of the production, if you do have, there are a few growers that still grow carnations left in, the, in, in Colorado. Um, and I'm actually going to take you to some cut flower operations that are very successful in Colorado. Uh, but 95% um, of all carnations are shipped in from other regions of the world. Um, it's probably mo almost 100% now, um, so forth. And it, the, the, what drove the domestic um, production down and the, and the foreign production up was the price of fuel and the price of labor. Plain and simple, it's cheaper to ship in carnations and almost all the carnations <laughs> that are shipped in the United States, almost all of them are coming out of Colombia and um, some out of Peru, some out of uh, Ecuador, uh, some out of Costa Rica, but it's primarily Colombia. And um, so the carnation industry is pretty much, um, like I said, there's only like a handful of cut flower growers left in, this, in the state. Most of the growers that have made the transition to survive is transitioned into bedding plants or something else. So. Carnations are propagated vegetatively. We propagate them um, uh, the to maintain their, the um, genetic characteristics of the cultivar. Uh, the standards are bred for flower number and size. The, um, over the years, they've, uh, through the breeding processes, when we have the multi-petals uh, inflorescences, if you look at the at the placement of where those inflorescences are, it's probably the anther that's that's been genetically converted uh, through the breeding process. So we have petaloid, what they're called petaloid anthers, and they look like a they look like a petal, but it's, if you look at the position on the inflorescence uh, itself, you'll see that it occurs in the region where the anthers would have been. Um, specialty propagators uh, dealing with cuttings. Um, a lot of the specialty propagators, primarily in Europe and in Israel, will do what's called virus indexing, and so that you're getting virus-free and verticillium wilt-free material, um, either rooted or unrooted. And we harvest our cuttings at four to five internodes, and um, we can store unrooted cuttings for up to six months in a cooler uh, if they're rooted. Of course, it doesn't last nearly as long. So they have a pretty long shelf life in storage. They're easy to root. Um, just put a little um, rooting hormone on them. Uh, they need full light. They like bright light, intermittent lit mist, and with bottom heat. Um, chrysanthem, uh, chrys carnations are a crop that like to have their toes warm. So light media, perlite, sphagnum peat moss, equal parts, well-drained, uh, susceptible to root rot. In the northern hemisphere for growing carnations, uh, we typically grow the standard in a ground bed one to two years. Some people go five to six before they renew their beds, so you need to plan your ground bed very well. Um, in the old days, we tried to rotate our, our cultivars fairly quickly, replacing half the crop every year with fresh cultivars, just to stay up, not so much to keep the beds renewed, but to stay up to date with the colors that the, that the florists and the market's demanding. Sprays, uh, spray types are, are re typically replanted every year, and they'll stagger the plantings every three to four months, so we have a consistent year-round harvest, because 
uh, carnation demand is 12 months out of the year. We plant our cuttings shallow. In fact, when we put the cuttings in the ground, a rooted cutting in the ground of a carnation, and this goes to the same thing for carnations if we're growing the perennial bedding plants uh, for outdoor production, carnations, the little dianthus mount, you want to plant them so shallow that they fall over almost. So we want to stick, if we stick them so deep that they're going to stand up like little sticks and little soldiers, the stem is going to rot. So we want to plant them as shallow as possible because they like a well aerated mix. They're very susceptible to stem rot. So that's why we plant them shallow. And you want to have them so they fall over, almost. You, worldwide, uh, we plant carnations in mostly ground beds because they get fairly tall. Um, we want to raise the ground bed up a little bit so that we not kicking debris or something or so as so the water can drain off the surface. Uh, raised beds, um, typically better insect control, a little taller so you're, anytime a, your labor has to stoop, it's costing you money. Well-drained uh, media, uh, good drainage is important. Um, typically, most production across the world is in, uh, in ground beds and native soil. Uh, with a little bit of sphagnum peat moss, perlite, and sand. We want the pH to be a 6 to 6.8, a little, just slightly on the acid side. But the critical thing that you need to remember about growing any carnation is drainage. Remember where it's native to. It's native to Mediterranean climates. Most Mediterranean species that we grow have to have well-drained uh, root system easily waterlogged. Steam pasteurization is best. Uh, methyl bromide, which um, is in the United States, is pretty much not used anymore, but in the other parts of the world it's still used a little bit. Um, carnations are very susceptible to uh, bromide toxicity. So anything that contains bromine, you want to make sure that you use, avoid with um, um, Carnations, uh, so actually no carnation grower ever used methyl bromide uh, because of the toxicity. The spacing that you use on plants, on, on your cuttings, when you, it depends on the time of year you plant. Like if you're only planting them for one year and then we're going to rotate the crop out, we're going to have about six plants per square foot. But if we're going for two to long, two years to longer, we want to use four to three plants per square foot because the plants are going to get fairly large. Um, depending on how fa fast you're cropping your crop, your plant material. Carnations are weak stemmed, and the uh, market demands a straight stem. So what we'll do is we will use. Um, um, some kind of a wire support. And here you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight layers of support in this particular crop. Uh, here's a, a low crop of some carnations um, being grown in Colorado. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll take the whole, all the layers and put them in place right after we plant the plants directly on the ground. And as the crop grows, we pull the um, the support up through the crop because it's hard to push it through the crop because that strips foliage. Remember the leaves kind of point up and we want to pull, the, pull it up. And this is for any crop because we have to have good quality straight stems. Carnations are pinched um, by hand. It's all hand work. We don't use tools with carnations. The, the stems should snap clean. If they don't snap clean, it was you're either trying to pinch it too early or there's something nutritionally wrong. Um, we don't use tools because we want to eliminate spreading of disease from plant to plant to plant with a tool. So the, make sure the employees wash their hands regularly. Um, we pinch plants right away to get good strong structure. And we'll talk about a couple pinching patterns. The single pinch is when the plant gets established, we'll, we'll do the single pinch and that breaks the lateral um, all to bloom at one time. Um, we do it three or four weeks after their cuttings are established. 
and we just take out the, the apex and leave four to five leaf pairs. Now that four to five leaf pairs, each of those leaf pairs will form a branch. And each branch then forms a stem with a bloom on it. And that's how many blooms you're going to get out of that plant. The next pinching practice is called a pinch and a half. And what a pinch and a half is, basically, after your first pinch, you pinch half the plant, or half the shoots. And what that does, and you do this when the, the shoots get about four or five inches long, or sometimes a little longer. And it, it happens five weeks after your first pinch if the plants are growing appropriately. And what you're doing is you're, now we're starting to stagger our harvest. <laughs> because we want to start harvesting um, our plant material on a weekly basis. We want to be able to generate and satisfy a market. The first harvest, of course, you're going to have half as many blooms, but yet your production is going to be over a longer period. And that's the goal, is to extend our production or get more uniform income. Double pinch. Um, double pinch is where Rather than pinching half, you pinch them all. And it gives you a, uh, another break. Everything comes off at the same time. Now a grower will do this to get more blooms off the plants that they've grown. But they typically have a target market date for that particular crop to get that volume out. Say they may be focusing on Mother's Day, or they may be focusing on Valentine's Day, or they may be focusing on Christmas or maybe they're growing white sim and they're going to dye them green for um, St. Patrick's Day. So they're focusing on a specific market. It's not as common. It takes a little longer for them to bloom, but everything comes off at the same time in a larger volume. So the, mar the choice of the pinching practice you use is depending on the market you're going for. Another pinching practice is called a single plus pull where the second pinch, you're not actually going in and cutting the stem. You're just pulling out the meristem. And it's probably not very common, but it's another practice. Different than pinching is a practice called disbudding. Pinching is where we're actually cutting the stem, breaking the stem off. We're just snapping it with our fingers. Disbudding is we're actually taking the flower bud that's forming out. And when, as soon as you can twist and snap that flower bud out uh, from its uh, pedestal, we're going to do that. So for standards, everything below the apical inflorescence is going to be disbudded. That drives all the energy into that single flower and makes a bigger flower. Sprays, the spray type, we're going to take out that um, apical bud, and that removes the dominance, the apical dominance. Now all those uh, lateral inflorescences will bloom at the same time. Um, and that's probably more common than anything else because a lot of people will just uh, buy nothing but spray types so that they have lots of little flowers they can stick in a, in a small, um, smaller arrangement. Summer prune back. Summer prune back is a, is a process uh, where we take our crop at the end of our production season, which is typically uh, we typically don't have much of a flower market from about the, uh, from the end of Mother's Day through um, the end of August. There's not much of a market for carnation. So what the growers will do is they'll do what's called a summer prune back. Well, they'll go back into the greenhouse and especially works in areas where it's too hot in the summertime to get good quality plants. They'll just go back and do a shearing. Well, they'll cut the plants back 12 to 16 inches above the, the, the ground and that takes out all the, um, the summer production, but it's a renewal system to regenerate new plant material for the next winter season. So this is for a grower that has no market for carnations in the summertime. And typically, a lot of what these growers would do, especially in Colorado, is they do summer prune back and then go fishing the rest of the summer. Now, modern carnation cultivars, under the modern breeding conditions, they flower perpetually. 
under a lot of different environmental conditions. They're called, typically, all carnations are, and most likely the, the, the perpetual bloomers, we use the word facultative or qualitative long days. Now what that means is they bloom better under long day conditions, bloom more efficiently under long day conditions, but we don't necessarily require long day conditions. We'll have fewer leaves, and, and the plants will be shorter. Short days, we have more bloom, more, more the, the plant will generate more foliage because it's trying to get more light. It's trying to harvest more energy, so as a consequence, the plant will develop more foliage. And spray and standards, they're no different between the photo periods. Now we'll see flower initiation after we get six to eight fully formed leaves on our stem. That's why we want to pinch before we get those six to eight fully formed leaves. So we're not pinching flowers. And the uppers and lower, lower nodes, um, of course, the lower the, the, the breaks, have to have a few more leaves. The upper breaks, less leaves, more flowers towards the top. And, but a lot of growers are going for those, especially on the standards, they're going to want to get those basal breaks, ones closest to the ground, because those give us the longest, uh, sturdiest stems for the, um, for the florist and, get it and c capture the highest value. Now the long days, facultative, if we extend our photo period past 13 hours, 13 hours of, uh, of light, um, or less than 13 hours of dark is what I should say, that's going to accelerate our flower initiation. It's going to speed it up. It only works with incandescent lights, red light, phytochrome, red far red shift. Fluorescent lights are very, virtually ineffective in this area because there's mostly blue light. Um, I don't know if there's any research done on the natural light or the warm light fluorescence, but I do know most of the research is shown incandescence. In fact, there's not a lot of carnation research that's more recent than the 1960s and 70s. High light, cool temperature. That's why Colorado is perfect. High light, cool temperature. So 21 days, long days, 21 days, short days. And what they do, what the growers would do, is they do this to moderate their flushes of growth, to program their crop. And if we're going to renovate that, those uh, plants that, that uh, we've sheared back with that uh, summer prune back, they need to have long days to regenerate that vegetative growth. But it's not an obligate scenario. Temperature, the optimum temperature for carnation production is a 50 degree night, that's optimum, and a 55 to 60 degree day. Cool Mediterranean climate conditions. Now, in the standards, not the spray types, in the standards, 41 degrees, a cool temperature, will speed flower initiation, whereas 50 degrees, greater than 50 degrees, delays flower initiation. So a lot of times they try to drive that temperature down with the standards and that will give them a better flower initiation. Once flower initiation occurs though, 50 degrees and above, or 50 degrees, it takes 40 days to visible bud, but if we bring it up to 68, that's 17 days. So that's 18 degree difference. Um, giving you 20, what is it, 23 days um, faster germination, faster development. And that's to visible bud. Now, from visible bud to anthesis, and I use the word anthesis, that means that you've got pollen shed. So you're going to harvest close to anthesis. So when I use the word anthesis, I'm talking about harvesting your plant. You can see that the temperature again, how much it affects plant growth. We get much higher than 68 though. With carnations, your flower quality goes down. Stem strength becomes soft and your flower quality goes down. Um, smaller flower diameter, the leaves are thinner, poor branching, they're weak. 
One of the things that a flower judge will do is they'll take a flower stem and hold it out um, horizontally. You want that flower stem to hold, ver you know, to stay horizontal, not to be limp at all. Spray carnations tolerate higher temperatures. And in fact, if you travel in South America, you will see spray carnations and standard carnations actually grown at different elevations. The standards will be at higher elevations and the sprays will be at lower elevations because they can, because of the, to, the differences in tolerances of temperature. And in Colombia and places like that, they get their different temperature regimens by building the greenhouse at different elevations. Remember, the savanna Bogota is 9,000 feet above sea level. That's where the, most of the people live in, in Colombia. Now they respond to as average temperatures, average daily temperature. Um, as we said, it's uh, primarily working on where the photosimilates go. Quality carnations require high light and cool temperatures. And the development of fan and pad cooling in Colorado uh, is what drove um, the production here as well. And that's <laughs> why the pad and pan cooling was developed to for quality carnations. They also, car, uh, carnations require low relative humidity, um, relatively low, 65 to 90 percent. However, any time carnation petals touch each other and you get liquid water on the petals, you need to watch for botrytis infection, alternary infection such as that, uh, very common in, in carnations. Light, uh, it's a facultative long day plant. Um, bright light, low light, we have more foliage, high light, uh, fewer, less foliage, and of course low radiation, low irradiation, low light equals weak stems and poor quality. So bright light, cool temperature is critical and key for carnation production. Some growers use overhead watering for their crop. But once we have visible buds, we can't water overhead anymore. So most growers use uh, sub-irrigation or a uh, trickle irrigation on the surface of the soil. Um, carnations um, grow best under wet, dry, wet, dry alternation. Uh, they don't like wet, cold toes. Co wet, cold toes. So you want to make sure that you keep the, the soil well drained and um, if you have low light levels, to strengthen that plant, you can water stress them. By, and that will give you a stronger plant during the winter months if you water stress. And of course, carnations are very susceptible to uh, soluble salts and root burn. Carnations are a crop that respond very efficiently to high levels of carbon dioxide. And in fact, you can inject and see a increase in photosynthesis rates uh, increasing the CO2 levels up to as much as 1,500 parts per million, which is uh, roughly five times ambient uh, CO2 levels. So highlight CO2 injection, the flower initiation is even faster. We use 25 to, um, for our soil analysis and our uh, analysis for soil. This is not the, um, what we use for the injection um, fertilizers, but this is the analysis of the soil that we want to see. 25 to 40 parts per million nitrate, 5 to 10 parts per million uh, phosphorus, phosphate, potassium, the ratio there, uh, calcium and magnesium. These are what we want to see as far as um, good nutritional balance in our potting soil. Uh, most people will put calcium, magnesium, and phosphate into the soil as they're blending it. Um, actually, a lot of growers never add phosphate because it seems to cycle pretty well. Uh, nitrogen and potassium, uh, we're going to apply that 200 parts per million. And typically for carnations, whereas most crops use a 2-1-2 ratio, carnations prefer, cut carnations prefer a 5-1-5 or 4-1-4, just have a little bit lower phosphate level in the system. Micros, um, all the standards, iron, zinc, copper, 
manganese, molybdenum, boron. Um, boron is critical uh, to maintain apical dominance in our plants. Uh, boron is re related to the development of um, cytokinins. And where we have an absence of boron, we get what's called a witch's broom. And what a witch's broom is, is we just have lots of spindly flowers sticking out. And it's very common, especially in Colorado, with our very clean runoff water, boron deficiency seems to be very high. So um, we see a lot of um, boron deficiency, and not just carnations, I'm seeing it in other crops now too, uh, especially some of our um, Ophiopogon species that are used as spikes in container plants and such, such as that, we're starting to see some boron deficiency. So again, it's excessive uh, branching. And another condition is called calyx split, where the calyx of the carnation um, splits open and, and makes the flower unsellable. We harvest uh, carnations. Um, your harvest is actually going to have a lot to do with your harvesting practice is going to have a lot to do with how much material, you, how much plant material you're going to be able to harvest later. So we want to have at least 18 nodes on that shoot that we're harvesting. But anything, all the basal breaks beneath that, that's your next crop. So we want to break it. We don't use a knife, again, for disease control. We leave on standards, two to three nodes beneath, so we get two to three breaks. On spray types, we leave four to eight so we get more breaks, okay? Those breaks underneath our harvest, those nodes underneath our harvest, that's our next crop. Okay. Standards, we take it, we harvest them when the bud is just starting to crack and show color. And um, with a spray type, we wanna have at least two to three of the flowers fully open so that we have things to, to produce. And actually when they're harvested uh, late and tight, they're hard to handle. And we'll go, uh, one of our tours that we'll do, we're gonna tour, and I haven't set all those dates up yet, one of our tours, we'll go to a wholesale florist and we'll be there when they open boxes that are shipped directly from Columbia that you'll see how far open they are when they harvest them. Insects and mites, thrips, uh, western flower thrips is one of our biggest problems. They get into the flower bud and they cause a, a streaking, of course a lot of viruses, um, but they'll cause, the thrips will get into the flower bud and you won't see the damage until the flower opens up and they have a rasping mouth part and it, they uh, damage the petal because uh, the thrips, remember, is a pollen feeder and they're going to be in the bloom first. Aphids, uh, aphids, um, the primary problem with aphids is they, is they transmit viruses and then of course spider mites which typically happens in hot dry greenhouses and is more of a problem during the summer months with our re renovation development. Diseases, of course we avoid viruses by, and viruses and verticillium by using index species but Fusarium alternary botrytis. Alternary botrytis are problems primarily on the, the flowers themselves uh, from high humidity. Rhizoctonia is an issue in the potting soil. And we can control a lot of the diseases just by trying to keep the humidity down. Calyx splitting is the primary disorder. Um, cuts the value of the crop, and what happens is um, the, the petals get so big that they split, they split the calyx, and they're growing it at inappropriate rates. And uh, you can get this from having erratic temperatures. You can have it from low nitrate, high ammonium, low boron. These sorts of things causes calyx splitting. Here's some pi pictures of some Colombian flower production. Um, this is an established bed of, of white sim carnations. These are scanned slides, so they're not the best quality. Here we have a crew, they're planting um, newly rooted cuttings in the, the beds. And uh, you see how the raised beds and then the 
What we see along the edge here, they, those are the um, water lines which they'll put into the raised beds. Here's after the uh, newly planted section. Uh, they're just, this has probably been planted about ten, uh, five to 10 days. And you can see that these uh, flower stems are probably about eight inches. And they'll probably getting ready to do their first uh, pinch. Uh, Colorado Carnation Industry uh, was founded um, with a marketing order. And what a marketing order is is that uh, the growers would tax themselves a certain amount per bunch. Uh, and that marketing order then paid for marketing and advertising as well as research. Um, the Perk Greenhouse Complex was paid for by this marketing order uh, as well as a lot of the things that happened in the past. Um, they had a lot of um, work that was done um, for, for advertising. And this is a galley proof of an um, advertisement page that occurred in Red Book Magazine. Um, and I wish I knew who that lady was, because she, her, that picture is everywhere in the materials. I've, uh, when I moved here 18 years ago, my office was full of all this stuff, and I've migrated it all to the library. And they're in the process of digitizing most of it. So, so here's some other photographs of um, marketing material that they would that they had, and most of this was targeted for magazines like Red Book. Um, I have some of these photographs hanging in my office, and somebody said, you know, that's those are pretty tacky, out of date photographs, and I said, of course they are. But in the 1960s, poodles and green was in as well as orange and avocado um, appliances. Here's some more modern. This is a standard carnation. Standards, you can see how they're proliferating with petals. Whereas the original carnation only had a row of five petals. Now the anther, we have with, uh, a lot of the breeding when you see uh, these are what we called um, petaloid stamens, and you have to dig really tight to find any other flower parts. This is a spray type. You can see the flower is a little smaller. Um, and this is a, what they look like when they're uh, coming into the um, shipment. Calyx split is where this, um, the green calyx it actually has a split and the petals look like they just fall out. Carnations are very susceptible to ethylene damage and we have a condition that's called sleepy carnations. And sleepy carnations um, and where is exposure to, to ethylene um, you can see that we have um, an ethylene generation. Uh, uh, they're autocatalytic, and you can see they generate their own ethylene after a point. But ethylene exposure at any particular point will drive it to the sleepy condition. And you can see that the, the progress of flower senescence. Here we have a fully mature carnation, and as the ethylene susceptibility happens, we get all the way down to senescence and plant death. And the carnations are one of those ones that, uh, one of those plants that most of the flower senescence literature is based upon. And we talk at the end of the semester, we talk about post-harvest physiology. Um, we'll talk about a little how this respiration curve works and how, how ethylene impacts that activity.